Welcome to episode 119 of the Necronama.com. Today, we're celebrating our two year anniversary. Whether you've listened to every single episode, or this is your first one, or somewhere in between, we appreciate the support you've given us in the last two years, and we really look forward to bringing you many, many more. I am James Sabata, horror author, screenwriter, co-host of the podcast you're listening to right now. And I don't know who this guy is that plays Thomas Sharp, but he's kind of weird looking. Know what you guys think? Uh, James, how dare you? (laughs) I know it was supposed to be a joke. Just, wow. (laughs) completely killed the That's how we start the two-year anniversary by immediately going to war. Completely (laughs) killed the flow here, man. (laughs) <laughs> well, I am Don Gillery, author, historian, educator, co-host of this podcast, and I will not, I absolutely not tolerate in any disparaging remarks about just the gorgeous human being <laughs> that Tom Hiddleston is. Yes. And I mean aesthetically <laughs> and his personality. <laughs> I, I won't tolerate that, man. Do you like how I walked in here with a hand grenade and just went here? (laughs) (laughs) All right. Good thing we're recording this through Skype and not through in person. Oh man, I would be dead now. Like you guys would be listening to me scream. (laughs) It'd be pretty fantastic. We should have done that. Yeah. Uh, So Corey, 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 Corey. I'm I'm pausing unnecessarily. You're back again. We are so excited to have you here. It's the two year anniversary of our show, and. I'm so honored. You had to be the one, you know? I don't know why. I I have to say welcome, welcome like 50 times now. (laughs) But yeah, so uh, for anybody who hasn't heard your past episodes, why don't you tell them a bit about yourself and then, you know, we'll jump in and talk about this. You guys said his name is Tom. Is that right? (sighs) Uh, (laughs) I'm Corey Corey. Um, I'm a teen horror blogger and podcaster, and I am the teen correspondent for Fangoria magazine. And I run the blog gory, Corey.com. Very cool. Oh, a second. I'm going to stop you, James. I'm going to stop you. Cause I, I, Corey is again, doing the Don, same thing. You do you this do. every time. I don't know. You are <laughs> underselling who you <laughs> that's, are. That's what, what I do. do. No. What you did I say that was incorrect? You just said it is, is so matter of factly. <laughs> All right. For those of you who have not checked out any of her stuff, Corey is like years ahead of anybody in her age group. And for that matter, anybody in our age group, when it comes to breaking down films, analyzing, discussing social issues uh, or, or discussing even some of the, the small little things. Now, I will forgive you since you've just you just now watched The Matrix. I'll forgive you for that one, just like I forgave James for Jaws. But James, no, when did you no, watch he Jaws? He never forgave me for Jaws. About a year ago. What? Even I watched <laughs> that one. Continue on. <laughs> anyway, if you don't know who she is, I'm going to be that annoying person in 10 years from now, whenever she's doing films and you know, doing whatever she needs to do. I'm going to be that annoying, like adopted uncle that says like, I always (laughs) believed in her. I knew her before any of you knew her. I'll be like, I'll be, I guess a a rebooted hipster at that point. (laughs) I really, I view you more like, like a man standing outside of the, the Chinese theater in LA going, no, no, I know her. And like, everybody's (laughs) like, sure, buddy. And like tapping you on the shoulder, trying to get you to move on. (laughs) Oh, that might work too. <laughs> uh, so while while we're all kissing up to Corey, here's my real thing. It's uh, you are the personification of the change we need. It's uh, wow. it's we're getting these voices that, that, I mean, all of all of all of movie world is glacially moving towards change, right? And what you bring to horror that I adore so much, we're getting voices of younger people. And yeah. then, like, every other thing that you post, you are so involved in, like, if I go to your Twitter, it's such a menagerie <laughs> of awesome stuff. 
because <laughs> I don't know about that. No, 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 really. Like, cause you can break down a film one second, flip around and insult somebody or like some political <laughs> thing going on and then flip around and be like, but in Scooby-Doo in 1960, this happened. <laughs> and it's, it's so cool to see that level of knowledge and respect for the business. Thank you. And that has nothing to do with your age. Cause I know people who are, I don't know, 30 years older than me that don't have knowledge and respect for the business. So that's, that's not that what I'm saying so at all. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> but like, really people need to go check out your shit. That's what I'm saying. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody give her a movie deal. Cause she has a lot of great ideas that she posts on Twitter all the time. So take them. <laughs> No, um, well, not take them, pay her for them. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and then you do this thing where you always pick great movies on our show. So oh, we've done you. Becky and Freaky. I feel like I, I missed something. I, I forgot I my favorite fucking one. movie. Sure. Yeah. You know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You didn't, but you agreed to it. So, yeah. So Becky, Freaky, Trick, Our Treat. And now this, like Crimson Peak is one of those films that I feel gets the this isn't horror bullshit answer oh, and uh yeah. anybody who listens to this knows my my ongoing war with the this isn't horror nonsense Me but too. like there's fucking supernatural shit happening and there's a woman being cut off from everything and taken advantage of like it's horrific uh, and can i just say spoiler her dad's death I love her dad's death. It's one of my so favorite good. deaths in film. So, <laughs> so fuck anyone who thinks this isn't horror. And, uh, and also finally, I just want to say that you did this great weird thing that happens because our 100th episode was shape of water, which I'm going to say at the end, it's one of my fucking films. And, uh, and then now our two year anniversary is crimson Perfect. peak. So clearly <laughs> we have this thing going on. We'll let you guys figure out when pan's labyrinth is coming. All right. So, <laughs> With that said, uh, I want to kick it to you too. Like, tell me your thoughts on this film overall. Like, Corey, why did you pick it? What does it mean to you? That kind of thing. I love this movie so much. And I have a weird, like, kind of history with it. When I, so I've been in love with Tom Hiddleston since I was like 12 years old. Like, he has been my favorite celebrity of all time. I've stalked him on every possible social media. Like, he was my number one favorite celebrity forever. And so, Horror was also my favorite genre. So when this movie came out, I think I was also 12 and I freaked out and I obsessed over this film so much and wanted to see it so badly. And my mom, since it was radar, was like, I have to watch it first before you can watch it. And she came back and was like, this is the worst movie I've ever seen. <laughs> it's so stupid. It's not that it's inappropriate. It's just that you can't watch it because it's stupid. <laughs> she was like, this is just dumb. So for the longest time, I didn't get to watch it. And then I finally watched it this year and I was like, this film is so beautiful and incredible and just a perfect, perfect gothic horror in every way. And the fact that my whole life I was told that this film was really dumb made me really upset. So <laughs> now I feel like I have to champion it <laughs> to everyone that doesn't like it. As That's you pretty should. fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that, well, I mean, we, we grew up in different eras. So I think for, for me, Having that same experience, it was I I didn't even ask my parents. It was I found the VHS or I got someone to rent the VHS if I was if I was too young and uh, watched it and kind of had that same determination of like, oh, my God, this is awesome. <laughs> and then somebody else was watching. This is the stupidest movie I've ever seen. <laughs> but the the first time I watched this movie, um, my problem with it was not necessarily anything with the movie. I'm not a big period piece person so i was actually angry at first because i was like who got who, who, who got who got del toro to make this like you know victorian gothic you know move what is going on here and then like the stuff because you know there were there was a ghost at the beginning and then there's like no ghosts no spirits anything for for a while right so it just seems like oh it's a it's a murder that takes place and they're conning this woman and this is going on and then it gets really dark, and you're like, oh, shit, you got me back. You got me back. Because I was really <laughs> worried when I saw the previews of this that it was going to be – because sorry for anybody who's out there who, who who loves these. I hate Jane Austen. And, I, and I'm and i glad they made the Jane Austen reference in this, in this 
But I hate Jane Austen. I do. I hate the Brontes. And it's nothing against the, it's, I think I just had a bad experience in, in, in my English courses and I hated anything like that. Uh, mm-hmm. when starting from high school. Uh, but this movie, for many reasons, the storytelling, the mixing of genres, the way that Del Toro plays with the audience with the screenplay by making references and stuff. So, you know, when Edith is is tr- is struggling as a writer, I should say struggling to be recognized as a writer because she's a woman. Or I should just stop saying that because it's never because somebody's a woman or because of their race. It's because someone's sexist or because mm-hmm. someone's racist uh, to put the ownership of the uh, of the uh, I guess whoever's the asshole or the, the obstacle on the person's actually doing it. Um, but, you know, she's dealing with all these obstacles that are put in her way. And then even when she gives a, a manuscript to her publisher, says, oh, there should be romance in this. There should be a love story. And what's funny is Del Toro plays with that aspect of horror as well by giving you a love story (laughs) in a horror story, which he does many different times. He does it with Shape of Water. Um, There's a little bit of romance within Pan's Labyrinth, Uh, you know, a little bit of a love story that takes place there. I mean, not a major storyline, but, you know, you got you got that taking place during the Spanish Civil War. Um, But I, I love the aesthetics here because of the use of color. Uh, the use of lighting, the, the the contrast. I think Corey, you and I went back and forth on this one about uh, snow being used in horror films, and the fact that yes. they use it perfectly in this. It's so good. Well, yeah, you have that contrast of white and red, mm-hmm. and because you've got that clay in the earth. I mean, it never it, it the whole scene once that changes to winter, the house even starts to change on the inside, where it looks as though the house is bleeding. Mm-hmm. And it's not just the the ground that's bleed. It's 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 masterfully done using the eye, using uh, your 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 sense of hearing, uh, and of course your your the the way that the story is going to be told itself. I mean, if 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 Del Toro had the the ability to, I'm sure he would make you able to taste your taste the movies. Yes, or smell what's going on because. Because even watching this, you get a sense of like how much clay and mildew and like the dampness that's there <laughs> because the way that he he draws all this stuff up and, and the production design, the way they all draw this up, it seems as though something great is happening that's going to hit all your senses. Totally. So I went on for a while there. So I, I obviously like the movie. The only problem I have with it is... I think this is the one movie that he made that was long that didn't have to be long. Yeah, I agree. So, <laughs> all right, Corey. So when you actually saw this movie and, you know, beyond, did you have that moment where you went back to your mom and were like, I don't understand why you didn't like this movie? Yes. But also, I'm very glad that I that it took so long for me to watch it because I think that if I hadn't read any gothic horror prior to this I wouldn't have had the same appreciation for it because I kind of get why she didn't like it because if you aren't used to gothic stories and you didn't like expect that going in then I feel like it makes sense when you would watch this and be like what is going on with with the incest and like ooh, and there's clay and all this like symbol like I, I feel like gothic uh, literature is a very specific taste, I guess, a niche that if you don't know it well enough, you're not going to be able to appreciate it in the same way. So I guess I understood why she didn't like it. She also gets very upset over things that are unrealistic. And I think she interpreted the clay being red as it being quite literally stained with blood. Mm-hmm. And she was like, you know how many people you would have to kill to get that much blood? It's just, it just doesn't make any sense. She says the same thing about the shining scene with the with the elevator blood. She gets so mad. But um, I did go back and I was like, how did you not like this? It's so good. But I, I get that it's a very specific acquired taste, I guess. Um, that's how I was with my mom. And, and uh, when I finally got her to sit down and watch Train to Busan, she's like, eh, it was okay. And I'm, what? I'm looking at her like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> oh my god! But she's not a big horror person. Like she, it, it's it's yeah. weird because 
she'll she'll watch any number of like ID channel murder mysteries where they just get into all this craziness, but she won't watch a horror film. But when you're talking about gothic horror itself or gothic literature, um, what would you use as a bridge for someone who would be reading in gothic literature into watching this film or from watching this film and then jumping into a good piece of gothic literature? I think definitely Frankenstein and any of Poe's works. Because, like, I know my senior year of high school this year, we um, studied those really heavily. And so we studied sort of the elements of, like, the ro- the romance within gothic horror and sort of, like, why it's so disturbing yet beautiful at the same time. And I think those are really important themes, I guess. And mm-hmm. I think Del Toro really, really nailed like a perfect gothic horror. And you can tell that he has such an appreciation for like Mary Shelley's works and that kind of thing. And um, because the story is just so similar to so many other gothic horror pieces that, yeah. But those are, I guess, sort of the classics are like Poe and um, Frankenstein. Yeah. You know, I was going to be upset if you didn't mention Poe. But even even with this. With this movie and in in what you were mentioning, uh, and of course referencing Poe, it it always makes me think back to one piece that I will not forget from when I read in high school, which was uh, uh, Mask of the Red Death. I mean, of yeah. course, a lot of people oh, yeah. to, to, to Cask of Amontillado. Definitely. And, but the Mask of the Red Death, it was it was weird because it was uh, mid nineties when 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 we read that. And it was still relevant to us as, you know, <laughs> smart ass teenagers. It was kind of like, oh, yeah, I get what is what's going on here. And I see this because you can make a comparison to age. You can make a comparison to this. But but just the, just the fact that gothic literature itself and I would even say gothic horror in general, where we're talking about plays or films, it's it's timeless. Whereas if, if you get to like the transcendentalist or if you get into the nonconformists themselves, a lot of that gets stuck within its own time. Definitely. Whereas this stuff, it, it, it stays with you. I mean, how many times have we recreated Frankenstein in, in, in any number of ways? <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's tremendous the way that it still has that reach, but a lot of people, I don't want to say that they're turned off by it, but I, I think a lot of people just don't have a full appreciation of it. Yeah, I don't think it's necessarily like, I mean, I, I learned it in school, but I don't think that it's taught in all schools. I know my parents didn't learn it. So I think it's just a something that not enough people got exposed to. Yeah, definitely. I went to uh, Catholic grade school and high school, which is why I'm not Catholic. And uh, <laughs> like we, I think we read two post stories and like no other horror like yeah. my entire time there i mean i was reading shit on my own but like as far as class stuff no what about you don was that was that the case for you like was it was it our time or was it because i was in catholic school or no no, no. i mean we had for for all the problems i i would say arose from my high school education uh, as far as not exposing me to a lot of things that I came to appreciate later, the stuff that they did appre- uh, did expose me to, I, I definitely stuck with me. I mean, the, more stuff, uh, more things definitely stuck with me than than not. Um, but especially things like like Poe. Any in, in the readings that we covered, especially if you had that one English teacher who was really into it, mm-hmm. uh, gave you the history behind things and and gave you uh, gave you a lot more background. Or if you had those uh, had those teachers who they went with the full symbolism and they're like, I don't give a shit. You're in my English class. This is honors English. Yes, Kublai Khan is is a is a is a is an opium driven sex fever dream. <laughs> yeah. And you would have those debates of 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 what's going on and and what the meaning is behind something and and the popularity of these stories or even getting into the mystery or behind Poe's death. It was interesting then and i think it's interesting now and i think one of the things and i can't speak for anybody who's in high school now or in high school english or high school literature programs 
But I think focusing on those aspects of literature would allow people to be a lot more expressive and actually look for a lot more things within films because, yeah, well, here it comes. I'm going to shit on a movie. We can only make so many Fast and Furious movies. <laughs> and I'm not saying that anything. I mean, they're fun to watch. There's, there's action. There's suspense. There's no gravity, apparently. There's no laws of physics. But when we kind of get too absorbed in those, we miss out on the areas of depth that can come from really good films like this, where I've watched it several times. And when I rewatched it again today, I noticed new things and I noticed new mm -hmm. connections and I noticed not just new connections to what was taking place in the film, but connections to previous readings. And so what you see in a film like this, or at least with a with a creator like Guillermo del Toro is He's taking all the stuff that he read, even from when he was in high school, and finding a way to put it into his films. And hopefully, you have that moment where it does reach somebody. It does reach, you know, that that one nerdy kid who happened to be... It, it, it becomes like an inside joke. Oh my gosh, I read <laughs> Casca of Montiago when I was in high school. and Oh, this is so crazy that they're doing this. Or the Telltale Heart. Or I read this. Um, or just... Or even like Game of Thrones fans, you're going to be suspicious of the brother and sister the first time you see them. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's from the literature as well as from the TV show. You are suspicious as to what their intentions are and what their goals are and what's going to take place. And even within that last 10 to 15 minutes, the story that gets woven up to that point does not unravel. If anything, it becomes tighter and more complicated because now you're realizing it's not just about scamming Edith. No. It's about the fact that they've been trying to do this so many times to keep themselves afloat that they've gone to all these different countries. And going to these different countries wasn't about getting money. It was about meeting these daughters, killing the fathers or killing off whoever their relatives were. So they're the only ones they could then transfer all the money to them. And then on top of that, you have this incest story. You have this murder story that took place when they were kids and how all this is, is going. So there's so much depth that's given about both of those characters and the house, for that matter, in like 15 to 20 minutes. And again, it's one of those things you can watch it. And, and this is nothing against your mom. I don't want, I don't <laughs> want to take this way. But it's one of those things where if you didn't like it the first time, I, I, I always implore watch people, like, watch it again. Yeah. Because that's how I was with Hereditary. I've watched, uh, first time I watched, I did not like it. I probably watched it five, six times since then. Wow. And I've actually liked it in the subsequent viewings because the first time I was kind of like, oh, God, this is not, this isn't that great. <laughs> and then you go back and you're like, yeah. holy shit. I see how they were able to build and give you all the clues leading up to this certain point. And then you watch it another time, you're like, oh, my God, there was another clue layered within this clue. And mm -hmm. I think that's what you see with this film is there's so much layering and so much depth that you can go through and see new stuff that gets that Del Toro builds from his own uh, his, his own interest in in literature, his own interest in film and trying to trying to basically create something that a lot of different people from a lot of different genres and fandoms can enjoy. Yeah, definitely. And so, I love how, how, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, no, I was, I was going to change the topic. If you have more to say, go ahead. I, just, I, I was just going to say like, you can tell you. how um, tight the script is and how much uh, Guillermo del Toro like really put into this to, to oh, yeah. give you so much foreshadowing and to put so many little different odes into each part of the script it's really incredible i wonder how long it took them to write this i don't know but they are tight foreshadowing it's not yeah. nothing feels forced nothing feels out of place or like like i couldn't pick out like oh he added this for this like it just right. naturally yeah. fucking flows and it's so beautiful which tells me he worked on it forever <laughs> definitely <laughs> Which is why it's so sad it that it got such a such a bad response from critics because like it's so well done, and I just think it wasn't appreciated enough. I think what happens with movies like this, and I could be totally fucking wrong. This is just my opinion, but 
Um, when you have movies that feel like three different movies, like combined into one, I feel like critics don't know what the fuck to do with that. Mm. And but to me, it's like you should because that's how life works. So yeah. again, <laughs> so that should, but that's also like very much in the gothic genre. There's so much that goes on and so oh, many yeah. different aspects of the story that you only find out at the end. So it's a big twist. Like that's yep. the whole point. Well, but even like, uh, you know, how sometimes it feels like a romance and sometimes it feels like a horror story and sometimes it feels like whatever else. But that's what and makes it so dynamic. <laughs> abs- no, absolutely. But I think that that confuses critics. Yeah, I think critics definitely. are so fucking used to formulaic play by numbers that mm. when something like this happens, you either get glowing reviews because they're so excited somebody did something or they're just like, the fuck did i just watch i don't know what to do with that and uh, and i think that's a real injustice and i'm hoping like i feel like filmmaking is leaning more into that now and uh and that's that's one of the reasons that i always shit on this isn't horror because i feel like you know horror can be one scene and it could still be horror so i i don't know i love how multifaceted it is how it represents different aspects of life and and I feel like it makes stronger characters because you get to see how they react in different situations. For sure. Well, well even with the critics themselves, it's, I'm glad you brought that up because it, you could have the same. I'm, I'm not going to say you're going to have the same film. If you were to compare Crimson Peak to Del Toro's Shape of Water, it's the same progression of the story. It's the same elements. It's the same things about isolation. It's about uh trying to coerce people in a lot of cases you got the romance you've got the horror you've got all those things critics like yeah. shape of water and that's what that's what bugged me about you know reading that the the way that they responded to this film maybe he was too ahead of the curve when it came to creating a story like that and maybe when he got shape of water he's like well fuck you guys i'm going to do the same movie with a fish man and we're gonna- <laughs> He's just gonna He's like, Duh, hammer put down on the another same house. idea. <laughs> yeah. No, definitely. Well, I also think that if this movie had been released by A24, critics would have loved it because A24 movies do such a similar thing where they have so many different elements to the story, but critics seem to be able to digest those. So I don't know. Speaking of A24, check out our episode on the lighthouse in two more weeks. All right. <laughs> so. <laughs> And that's how Don found out we're doing the lighthouse, everybody. All right. So uh, <laughs> I, I want to flip this a little bit. Um, if you guys want to come back to this, that's cool. I just I really don't want to lose my question. I want to ask you. I said earlier that your voice is extremely important. And I think that this movie reflects that. And I want kind of your your insight on Edith. We have her not being accepted as a writer. We have her being constantly, she's just an object to everybody. Her dad wants her to do a certain thing. This guy that's always been in love with her wants her to do a certain thing. The, the you know, Tom Hiddleston's character wants her to do something. Like everybody's always controlling her. Like everybody's forcing her life where they want it to go. And just how this reflects the overall struggle women have every fucking day. That was something I really appreciated about this movie was I think it has a very interesting feminist spin onto what most movies, especially in this time period, have. Um, I think it was a really fascinating way of uh, showcasing that control kind of. um, I appreciated how most of the men besides Thomas didn't really control her, though, like her dad wanted her to do something, but he would still, you know, publish her writing. Um, even though he might not have wanted to, but I do definitely understand that kind of like people around you being like, Oh, great. You're a writer. That's awesome. Like, good for you. So great. Come to, come to us when you have a real job type thing. And, um, yeah, it's, it's really sad that it's to this day, such a, an issue. Um, I thankfully have very supportive parents, but it, is still very difficult. Just every man seems to want to give me his opinion on anything. Um, especially 
my job, especially men that have no idea what I do. Like they'll give me advice on, on college or on my blog when they've never read my blog, when they majored in something completely different, went to a totally different school, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it was really empowering watching Edith just completely ignore every single piece of advice that the men in the film gave her. Um, one thing I didn't love was how most of the advice of like her not leaving was pretty good advice, but she ended up living in the end. So I feel like good for her. Um, I don't know. I thought this was a great portrayal of how women are often um, women and non-binary people are often like very much controlled and everyone just has an opinion on what they should be doing. Right. And no one wants to re- to even ask them about what they want. If everyone around you is giving you shit advice, yeah. it's hard to listen to the good stuff too, right? Like, No, it is. It's so difficult, especially because it's like, I'll have so many people that will mansplain things to me and they'll give me like a little bit of good advice and the rest of the advice is horrible. And it's like, how much of this should I really take, you know? And it's just, it's really hard to navigate. That's just one of those things where if you don't, you start to question their intentions as well. Yeah, absolutely. But I do, um, I really love how the female characters are portrayed in this film. I think that both Edith and Lucille are kind of, and how the the men are, I feel like are written like women and the women are written like men, if that makes sense. Because it all totally of the, does. That's awesome. <laughs> all of the men in this film are kind of ruled by their love for Edith or for um, Lucille. Whereas the women in this film, they have ambitions. They're much more independent and they get more done. Mm-hmm. I think Lucille even though Lucille is like so horribly evil and I hate her, she's also one of my favorite characters because she's just so, it's so fun to watch her just manipulate everyone because she's so good at it. And you rarely ever get to see women do that. And I think we almost never have female antagonists. So this one was really satisfying to watch. And again, Edith, like she knows exactly what she wants. She wants to be a writer and she is, she's writing And she just kind of goes for it. And it doesn't matter what all the men around her say and what all the other women judge her for. She just does it anyways. I think the only time that a woman is not portrayed in a good way is when her mom says, stay away from Crimson Peak. Like if she would have told her the right name of the place, this would have really helped out. That's my biggest issue with this is like, why not just (laughs) say stay away from Thomas Sharp? Like that's all you you had to do. And also... Why does she tell her this when she's a little girl, when she could just tell her, like, could she not have come to her the day that Thomas came to the place? She could have haunted that newspaper place. What are they going to do? Like, She had already used up her frequent flyer miles as a ghost. <laughs> she couldn't come back. She's like, I need to go see my child and give her a warning. They're like, right now? We could wait. <laughs> That's hilarious. But it's like, Can you imagine? Of- why didn't she just say day. the right yeah. name? It bothers me so much. That's like my biggest pet peeve with this movie. I think my biggest pet peeve with it is along the same lines, but it's also that it feels completely fucking unnecessary. Yeah. This warning this warning is legitimately my one huge complaint with this film because I don't feel like it serves anything other than making the audience go, oh, except they already know because that's the name of the fucking film, man. Yeah. <laughs> so, also, like, even if that wasn't Crimson Peak, that is a creepy house. Like, there's oh, no shit. way you should be living there. It's definitely cursed. It's got like <laughs> goo dripping down the walls and stuff. No way. Don, would you it walk really... into this house? I wouldn't have even walked past the gate. <laughs> no. <laughs> I would Meanwhile, I'd like, be like on second wait, floor calling wait, wait people. Wait a second. <laughs> you are an aristocrat and you live in this. And <laughs> uh, right? Red now. flags. The second <laughs> that Lucille was like, we don't have butterflies. We only have moths that eat everything. <laughs> I would be like, no, thanks. Don't need to move there. Um, yeah, no, it really feels like they wanted an opening with a ghost in it. And they just figured that was what they wanted, you know? They're like, why don't we just throw this in? We'll have her mom give her some random warning that won't be helpful in the slightest. I would love to know if that was a Del Toro <laughs> thing 
or if it was like the studio was like, no, 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 we need to open with the we ghost. That's with why people horror, are yeah. here. And, uh, sure and that was, was like the, the easiest way to do it, you know? I guess it also gave her that obsession with ghosts that she has in her writing, but it seems like there could have been something else they did with that. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Well, besides <laughs> it's just that, always bothered great. me. <laughs> it just always bothered me. I'm like, just say totally. the name of the real place, but yours yeah. makes way more fucking sense. Stay away from this dude, you know? Because it's like... Could she not have said Allerdale Hall, though? Like, it doesn't seem like it's that hard. Why would she? It, it's just so <laughs> stupid. You brought up this thing earlier, and it, it it made me go back to my notes and think about this. But uh, that that interaction that you have between between Edith and those those other women uh, when they're criticizing her, you know, wanting to be a writer, and they say, "Oh well, Jane Austen, you know, died a <laughs> spinster," and she immediately the the wit that she yeah. has she immediately you know it's like well but mary shelley died a widower i uh, uh, died a widow and just goes about uh, about her life and you instantly for the most part you instantly should fall in love with her character because you're like oh okay she's somebody who's like i'm not going to take no for an answer i'm going to find a way around this so even when the publisher's like no this isn't going to work and then she goes to her father's like, can I use your, you know, your typewriter? Uh, because my handwriting is too feminine. Mm-hmm. And if a publisher sees it, they're going to reject it. And just thinking about it. And for some people with without the historical literacy or even with with not understanding the 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 difficulties that women would go through, you know, even up till now, that idea that women writers and I hate saying that. But writers who happen to be women or identify as women have to jump through so many more hoops. Mm-hmm. I, you know, one of the best books I read when I was a kid was The Outsiders. You know, it's about all these rough and tumble boys in Oklahoma getting into fights and doing all this sort of stuff. And I loved how my English teacher, you know, after we'd read the book, she said, oh, yeah, a woman wrote that book. And I'm thinking to myself. Because I guess I was a little bit more progressive. I was like, I don't give a shit. This is a good book. They were fighting yeah. and people were dying and, and stabbed. This is awesome. But then she <laughs> explained why S.E. Hinton went by the initials. It was because no one was going to, she felt no one was going to take her seriously if she wrote her full name out as Susan Elizabeth Hinton. And she's writing about teenage boys in Oklahoma that are just getting into all types of trouble and, and fighting and doing all these different things. And then you see that with a, a good number of, of writers where they have to mask who they are. They have to change their name or they have to, you know, take a, a pseudonym or a pen name to to be accepted. But then you also have to look at the people like Mary Shelley who's like, no, fuck you. I'm going to use my name. Yeah. <laughs> Deal with it. Well, and by the way, she didn't get to at first, but well, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> but I mean, but, but we know her as that. If there is no, there is no confusion. No one's going to say, "Oh my gosh, was this is a guy who wrote this book and just well, changed his name to Mary?" Actually, there are a lot of people that they have a theory that it was actually her husband. But besides those people, uh, those I'm not. I'm going to keep that to myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> While we're on that subject, I have this theory that actually flows into that, which is that Mary helped him so much that his writing reflected Mary. Clearly, right? That seems to make the most sense. And and he wrote a lot of poetry. So, like, if she had a better grasp on fiction, for instance, and this is all conjecture, I don't fucking know, you know. But, like, if she did, and then she was helping him, her voice would be there. And then that would be the voice the reader is used to. And then she would do this. But even if she's writing on her own, if she's been partnering with him at all, you're going to see similarities. Yeah. So I get where they were coming from, but I don't think they put enough actual thought into (laughs) it. Well, I could imagine they're walking around the house and Mary says, hey, Percy, uh, your prose on this part is to, you know, it's poetry. So kind of tone it down a little bit. (laughs) No, yeah, definitely. Plus, I mean, his name's Percy. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> anyway. I just like picking on Percy. <laughs> we'll go back to this film, I guess. Jeez. I, uh, no. Um, one of the things that I love most about this film, I kind of mentioned early on, but it's the scene where they kill her dad. Yes. And this death is so great. But I think what makes it better 
is that we haven't been in that mindset. We haven't been presented mm-hmm. with horror and grotesque. We've been in this almost pseudo romance thing going on and like, you know, just family drama stuff and that kind of thing. And, and then we just get this hard fucking <laughs> like, like it's like our heads are being slammed into the sink because totally. that's how good this fucking screenplay is. And I just, I absolutely adore this scene. I enjoy the simplicity of it. I like how it perfectly makes sense. And, and also, like I said, just, it's that tonal shift that del toro is so good at um so i guess my question to you guys with that death in particular is when you first saw it like were you totally like blown away or like like what did this death do for you did it shift how you were watching this film yeah Mm. definitely i think the way it's shot too is makes it so much more like you feel like you're getting your head hit into the scene yeah and so it's just such a perfect way of doing that. And it makes, as you said, like it, it fits so well with the story and makes so much sense. And it's such a simple, almost like it, it reminded me sort of of like a Giallo or a slasher with the gloves and just the really quick sort of anonymous kill. I mean, we all know who did it, but like, you don't. Know, and that's the saying. second part of what I'm going to say. We'll get there so, in a second. Yeah. But. but I just loved it. I thought it was probably the best, one of the better kills. I think the best kill in this movie, maybe. Yeah. So the thing that I love about it is, is who did it? Mm -hmm. Because this goes directly into what we're talking about, because it was Lucille. Mm -hmm. And we are so trained. We're so fucking trained that it's Thomas Sharp, right? Mm -hmm. Even at the beginning, when I first watched it, I immediately thought it was Thomas. Oh, really? Until it, until it progressed. And I was thinking like, well, this is Del Toro, so he's probably had the sister who did it. And again, I just love that so much. It it just this whole film completely flips the gender roles, and it was so ahead of its time for 2015. But I mean, this goes a step further. The very the setting itself is there to condition you that it's a man that killed him. Right. Yeah, and I fucking love that. Like it's such. It's just fucking with expectations. And that's that's something I love, obviously. But in this situation, it goes back to what you were saying, where the women are written more like we're conditioned to believe men are written, you know, like, mm-hmm. like, well, not conditioned to believe, you know what I'm trying to say, the way men are normally written, and the aggressive and in charge killer, this is totally <laughs> there to make us think that it's Thomas. And I love that it's the woman getting, getting the kill. It's yeah. great. But then as Don was saying, the more you, you go on to watch it, you realize that Thomas would like absolutely not do that. Like he's right. such a he's kind of a no. wimp and like would never Well it, and his sister even calls him out for it. You know, yeah. Lucille at in the end she's like, Oh, now I think you should finally get your hands dirty. Or now you should you should finally get your hands yep. dirty after all this time or something like that. Because up to that point, she's killed everybody, including their mother. <laughs> <laughs> so it's She's like, I did all the work. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that mother kind of seemed like she had it coming, not going to lie. but Right? (laughs) I agree. Yeah. Um, Also, can we talk about the acting in this film? Because when I realized that Jim Beaver, a.k.a. Bobby from Supernatural, was playing Edith's dad, like, it, Mm -hmm. I just couldn't deal with that. Like, it, it melted my brain. The role was written specifically for him as well. Was it? Really? I just can't see him as anything but Bobby. So it was, he is such, <laughs> so much range, but um, that was awesome. Yeah, I absolutely love him in this. Like, yeah, it was, I don't know. There's something the about him that we get with him. That's wow. exactly it. Like, as much as I love his death, I was still <laughs> like, oh, I want more of him. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Give us a backstory. <laughs> and then she'll be the prequel ghost. to it. No. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it would have been fun if he came back as a ghost. <laughs> and then Mia, I don't know how to say her last name, <laughs> was so good as Edith. She was like oh, yeah. perfect for this role. Um, and of course, Tom Hiddleston and Jessica Chastain like rocked this role. I feel like this was so fun for them. You know what? You you bring them up and I'm going to say this since you already complimented them. I was not disappointed in Charlie Hunnam. Yeah. 
at all because I, I watched him in the 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 Lost World of Z or, or I forgot what it was called, Lost City of Z, uh, and a couple other things. I was kind of like, ah, I don't buy him as an adventure. I mean, just you know, yeah, he was on Sons of Anarchy, but I didn't buy him as like this this you know absentee father who's going around adventuring. Mm-hmm. It it just didn't seem there. It seemed like he was trying to not be the character from from Sons of Anarchy, whereas in this film, it it seemed as though he fit right in. Totally. And I, th- I think it was just like the, the, the perfect combination of everybody, everybody being there and, and getting the assignments and fulfilling the, filling the duties of the assignment. Yeah. Everyone in this film totally understood the assignment 100%. <laughs> and I wonder if that's a test of like just Guillermo's direction or, or what, I don't know, but it was great. I think that might play into it because even with, with Pan's Labyrinth, Shape of Water, anything else that he's done, I haven't seen anybody that was part of the cast, even if they were weak in another film or in something mm-hmm. else I saw them in. I didn't see that weakness show up or that lack of chemistry show up in in Del Toro's movies. Yeah, I'm a firm believer that if you're a good enough director, you can get at least a believable performance from anyone. One of the things that I love that Del Toro does the most is he excels at taking the same motivation and expressing it completely differently in every character. Yeah. And in this one, uh, the one I'm thinking of is survival and every, not every character, but the, the major characters in this survival is a big thing, whether it's her dad wanting the family to survive and, and, you know, the next generation be ready to carry the carry on. Right. Or obviously Edith needs to fucking survive and <laughs> Lucille's trying to survive. But I love how he can take these these core motivations and just they feel like totally separate things because of how characters express them and how it drives them and stuff like that. And I I go into what you were saying, like, is it his direction? Like, I'm thinking about this motivation thing and I can't help but like. I assume that he must sit down with them and like, if he's not directly handing it to him, like think about how your character would be driven by survival or how they'd be driven by this, you know, that sort of thing. And even that those conversations help direction so much, you know? Oh yeah, for sure. So I always, uh, I always go back to how Alan Rickman knew Snape's story (laughs) before the books were done, you know? And uh, and kept it a secret. But like that changes how you play everything. Yeah. And and it shows. And that's why he's the best character in that series, in my opinion. But um, with Del Toro, like I see it in all of his stuff, like in our Shape of Water episode, we talked about being alone and every single character has that in them and expresses it differently. And I just think that's like his fucking superpower. And I love it. That's really beautiful. All right. Well, I'm going to the history with this film now. Before, oh, man. Before Here we, we get too far into the film. Um, when I watched this the first time, I, I noted it and now watched it since then a few more times. Um, and maybe I was just more annoyed at it. <laughs> this, I was going to ask you about went, the historical accuracy of it. Oh, I'm not I'm not even going to get into that. What I mean okay. as far as the, the, the way things are represented, which are that have not aged or I should say still remain timeless, which is everyone is so enthralled with this idea of this baronet showing up, right? This Mm -hmm. European showing up and the fact that he's going to be able to teach them how to do the waltz, right? So for them, it it just, it just struck me as odd uh, the way that, that Edith's father responded uh, the way that, uh, gosh, what was it? Mrs. McMichael responded. And how all these people are kind of fawning over him. They're having this party. They're having this ball. It's kind of like, yeah, everybody in that room is more important than him. But because of who he is or who he who he claims to be, he has an elevated status. Uh, So for me, historically, it 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 reminded me of that same time period of the the Gilded Age, the Victorian Age, where so much of American culture was was being directed by European traditions and European culture or European behavior to where it's like, this came from this place. 
that means it's really good. And it could be really shitty, but just because it came from this country, <laughs> it's so much better. Or this guy is coming because Edith sees through him. She's like, he's broke. Like he's wearing a suit that's 10 years old, dad. Mm -hmm. Like something's going because she's not she's not fawning over him like everybody else is. So she's kind of seeing not just through the facade, but she's kind of seeing through the bullshit of what all these people are, are just enamored with. And yeah, they do fall in love or fall in like or fall in lust or whatever you want to call it. But for her, it's not the title the guy has. She just enjoys being with him. As yeah. opposed to all these other people see his status or see his title and say that as this is something to aspire to be. And her father uses this opportunity to at least one of his opportunities to dress him down, dress Thomas down a couple of times and say, like, yeah, I get it. You want my money. You need some money. To, you know, you've been going and getting money from all these other people you need money from. Great. You know, I looked I looked up uh, I, 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 I did some research on you. I tried to find out what was going on. And then he has this spiel about if you want to get my respect, you got to do it by honest, hard work, just like I did. Uh, it's, you know, and you got to this country was built off of hard work. And I'm sitting there like, you lying son of a bitch. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you started off working in a steel mill and you have all this. That is a lie. Uh, <laughs> that's lie number one. Uh, because when you when you look at periods, especially like the Gilded Age, those racks to riches stories were complete garbage. Oh yeah, uh, and they were they were really all part of the 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 PR to get people to work harder. Like like you have it now where people say, well, you're only making seven twenty five. Well, you should have gotten a better job with more 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 money. And now people are doing that, and people are freaking out and saying, why aren't you waiting tables? I need somebody to wait <laughs> tables. But you told oh, me to totally. go get a job where I made more money. <laughs> yeah. And I think that plays into like the idea of the American dream, which is fair. Yeah. And, yeah. but I think that's a very important part of why he doesn't like Thomas. Cause I feel like that American spiel, I guess, about hard work and, and no matter, even if you came from England, you had money there, like you got to work here to make it. I think right. was really where he was coming from with that. So that played into his character of being like very clearly American, whereas Thomas is very clearly British. Yeah, and you had that break. I mean, as far as the the Americans who were enthralled with Europeans and everything European, right? Mm -hmm. But then you had those those nativists. I guess you could say the ones that loved him were nativists also. But you had those nativists that were stuck on, I'm here. I did this hard work. You can come here and do it too. I don't give a damn what title you have or anything like that. Where yeah. in the back of his mind, he probably did, but he... It wasn't an issue of handing this man over to his daughter. It was more an issue of, I'm not going to do business with you because I don't want to lose what I've worked hard on for you, you know, whatever this machine is or whatever, you know, scheme you've got going on. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's very telling of the time period. And I, I'm not going to give it a, you know, it, it was... It was historically inaccurate for this or historically accurate for 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 this reason, because that wasn't the focus of it. But uh, the clothing was nice. The clo <laughs> Can we talk about the clothing? Because I Please do. it symbolizes so much in the films and it's really gorgeous. Um, and the way that like all of the uh, the way that the sharps are always dressed in black, whereas Edith is always dressed in white or yellow. Um, right. And so is Alan. I just love that. It's so nice. And the the dress that Lucille wears in the first scene that we see her in when she's playing piano, it has this, it's this red dress with this long train that totally looks like she's sitting in this pool of blood. And it's just, mm. it's amazing. Every single piece of like the colors and symbolism in this film was so like perfectly planned. And I love that. Yeah. I mean, if you look at like the first part of the film where the, the part we were kind of calling romance part um, like the lighting is so different than mm -hmm. what happens once she's secluded at Crimson Peak and, you know, like, but even like when supernatural stuff happens, you get like this little green tinge first and things like that. And then the red really pops against it, you know? Yeah. And it's like the twilight filter. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, no, like, I mean, 
del toro does this a lot with everything he does like the colors and shape of water are just fucking phenomenal as well you know and it's one of those things that i wish more people did yeah but i didn't really notice it as much in this one but i was kind of wondering maybe you know maybe you don't but um like shape of water like some of the images are just stacked images they're just like things that weren't really in the shot on top of each other to like oh, really? make it a more interesting shot right and yeah. and I was wondering, like, if he did that with this or if it was a technology they didn't have yet. But I'm guessing neither of you know, but I had I'm, to throw it out there. I'm sure they did with at least parts of the house, right? Because there's no way that that huge house could have looked like that, I think. Yeah. I don't know. I would assume, but I don't know. Yeah. Anyway. No, the colors um, are uh, just <laughs> fucking like the red. The red of the, the red uh, in the supernatural. Movie. Yeah, the, the supernatural beings in red works mm-hmm. so well for me Doug like Jones. i want to see that more in other stuff like yeah i thought that was really effective the ghost colors were really cool too with how like thomas sharp was all in white when he was a ghost but then lucille was black and uh lady sharp i think was red it was interesting i didn't notice that but that's great I, I noticed it with lucille but like not i didn't notice the others wow cool. yeah like all the ones that were murdered were red Except for Tom, who was white. And then, huh. yeah. Well, that's cool. Yeah. Um, I think it's really interesting that you po- the you pointed out the color change from when she was it, in the beginning and then at the house. And I think that was like a really cool... I love how that shift happened because it kind of showed, I think, how amazing someone can seem especially if they're manipulating you and you're in like an abusive relationship. And then once you get married or once you get sort of trapped by them, how much scarier mm-hmm. that is and how you don't even realize that it's abuse until you see it firsthand. And I think this is also just a really beautiful portrayal or good portrayal of kind of abusive relationships in that sense. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I uh, I also think uh, it's almost symbolic of hope to me. Like, mm-hmm. like it's so much brighter when there's a lot of hope. And then as soon as she's in a really dangerous place, we go the opposite direction with that. Yeah. And But what I like about it is, like, I, it's not like it would occur to her. It's solely for us, right? But it right. also, it just adds so much atmosphere. So, like, because it's lighter, I think the house is creepier than it would be if we started with the house. Yeah. Like if we were always at Crimson Peak, I think it'd be a creepy fucking place. But I think it hits harder because of what we're used to. Definitely. All right. Here's it's not a problem of the movie, <laughs> but it was something I found funny. The dog showing up. Yes. Right. The dog showing up. And then there's that conversation that takes place. And this was something that was funny to me. The conversation that takes place between Thomas and Lucille was like, I thought you got rid of that thing. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I left it in the woods. I thought it was going to die. But that's and, again another one where Thomas was told to kill it and then right. didn't. And then Lucille ends up killing the dog, which I know there are a lot of people who are like, "Don't kill the dog. You can't kill." <laughs> but you see how how what what a monster this woman is, right? Yeah, she has no humanity. She's she's not going to spare the dog. In fact, she didn't want to spare the dog from the beginning. And it makes sense, and I'm glad, obviously, that they didn't show it taking place, but you know when it's happening, and you're sitting there thinking like, well, fuck, there's no hope for Edith. Like, if this woman is, is this incensed, and she's now been caught, and and all this is going on now you have the she there's no hope for her yeah um because there's no there's no part of uh, of lucille's that's going to look at it and say well you know what let's keep the dog for the next person that comes up (laughs) that poor dog i always forget that they had dogs back then and then uh, they never include them in period piece movies i feel like so this was kind of refreshing to see it in this one yeah especially not like toy dog and it might be wrong but uh, you know, you typically would see like hunting dogs or, or, you know, I don't know all the classifications of it, but you would see larger yeah. dogs, but they don't have a presence in the movie like this dog did where mm-hmm. the dog this was an is an aristocratic dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where, you know, where, where Edith is playing with the dog throughout the house 
And that ends up leading her to places where she's not really supposed to be going. But you know, you, you kind of question how would she have gone to those places if the dog hadn't been around? No, I think the dog was definitely a huge help to her in getting out of the house and figuring out what was wrong with it. Oh, especially that part where, you know, she thinks the dog has gone into one of the rooms. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she grabs the door, the door snaps that back at it, you know. Oh, God. And it, yeah, I love that part because then then she looks and she sees the dog. And it's one of those moments where in any other horror movie, if this has been a haunted house movie, which, you know, you've got these portions of it that are. But if it had been primarily a haunted, haunted house movie, this would have been the part where at the audience would have been like, just get the fuck out of the house right now. Just leave. <laughs> just go now. Don't look back. Leave. Well, again, the really cool part about this is like you can tell that she can't leave. There's nowhere she can go. The town right. isn't for like miles. And I think, again, that's a really good portrayal of how abusive relationships are so trapping. Like mm-hmm. you, you just she's so helpless and there's nothing that she really can do, even when she figures out what's going on. Well, they even make a point of it because when um, when Lucille and Thomas are having that discussion about the women or in especially when they're talking about Edith, the whole idea of they were intentionally picking women that had no family. So yeah. there's not an issue of anybody's going to come looking for you. But then there's also, as you, as you pointed out, Corey, there's the whole idea of there's not just no one's going to be coming looking for you. There's no exactly. one else that you can depend on. So you're stuck with us. There's yeah. no one you can fight in. There's no one you can go to. There's no one that you can think could be out there uh, who's going to eventually help you. You're stuck. Yeah. And again, that's exactly what happens in abusive relationships. They remove you from everyone that could help you get out. So it's mm-hmm. just oh, so perfect, this movie. <laughs> and it also, it works really well to show, um, what, what's the other guy's name? The one who comes Alan. to save her? Thank you. Dr. It, Allen. It, it shows his determination and how much he cares. Yeah. Because in a lot of, in a lot of films, we'd be like, oh good, it's the the stand-in boyfriend guy the backup plan you know but this guy we get characterization in the trip he's willing to make to save her yeah and yeah, I'm, I'm glad even like when that. the town when the townspeople are like oh you can't go that's like four miles he's like meet me there tomorrow you know <laughs> like, <laughs> or whenever the storm ends or whatever he says like that's fucking determination that's great yeah yeah, and even then, it's it's not an issue with him. And I'm glad you brought up the point about like, he's not a stand-in boyfriend. For him, it's not expressed that he's there like, oh, you know, I'm I'm the one she should be with. Because that doesn't even seem to be his motivation, no. even when she's not with anyone. It's no. kind of like, oh, you know, I, I know your dad. Like, we're friends. Yeah. We're this. You know, I'm, but for her, it, it seems as though from the first moment that they leave and then he start, he goes to the house and the house is being liquidated. You know, he knows that something's wrong. He gets the he gets the 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 investigators uh, gets the information from that private investigator. And he's like, no, I need to go save her because she has nobody. Like, and if I don't do it, you know, kind of that guilt of I have the means to go on this trip to go and help her out or at least check on her. And if I don't, I'm going to feel guilty that that something, you know, something would have befallen her as well. Yeah. Uh, because even then he's not like, oh, I, you know, as he's, you know, been stabbed. Oh, I've always loved you. And, you know, yeah. that kind of that kind of cheesy romantic thing that gets thrown in of like, I, you know, I could I couldn't bear to be apart from you. It was just kind of like, come on, we're leaving. Let's go. You've been mm-hmm. poisoning her. I'm taking her away from here. Just very matter of factly. And even when, you know, it. Even when he does get that opportunity to get her out, it's it's not a thing of finally we can be together. You know? <laughs> yeah, definitely. No, I think that's uh, I think that's what's so great about him is it's yeah, it it's another very, change like, of character. expectations. What yeah. was that? I'm sorry. It just it made him such a, a likable character for me, at right. least, because I was like, well, he's not the worst. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're not actively hoping that Lucille kills him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was very. And some happy movies with we would be. This, well, this felt like. With, such, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was gonna say even with the the the, the killing right when she tells uh, when when Lucille tells Thomas to to get his hands dirty right and hands him the knife and there's that moment where again 
Del Toro does twist you again. He asks Alan or Dr. McMichael, like, you're a doctor. Um, is is either her or it's me. You're a doctor. Tell me where I should where to stab you. Right. Yeah. So you're thinking like, oh, where's he can kill him with the least amount of pain or he can do sort of, you know, whatever he can. Right. And so at that moment, you're thinking Alan is there dying right at the entrance. And then, a, you know, scene later, you see that Thomas is escorting him to the to the sub basement to to escape from the house. And and the fact that he understands, like, I'm not a monster like my sister is and I don't want to be a monster. It's just I feel this duty. Whatever, you know, jacked up relationship that they have, I feel I have this duty like to do whatever she tells me to do or participate in this, because if I don't, we're, you know, we're going to be separated and we'll never see each other again. She'll go to an institution again. Yeah, definitely. And Tom Hiddleston understood this role. He understood the assignment so well. I'm I'm going to hype him up more because he's, I think, one of the greatest actors of our time. And just his performance, every time I watch it in this movie, it it's just so good. Everything about it. He just, he perfectly got this one. Has he been in other stuff? I'm, I'm really totally James. Kidding. Totally James. Really kidding. James? <laughs> <laughs> he's my pick to be the next James Bond. Yes, He's my pick to be the next James Bond. He's my pick to be the next everything. Just cast him in every single movie, please. Well, they need a new doctor, so he could be the doctor. Yes. Well, here, let me take it back. Is to Loki Marvel not here. the doctor? <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> what were you going to say, Don? <laughs> I was going to say it, it, when Corey's talking about he understood the assignment. When they were casting him for for the Marvel universe, they didn't tell him whether he was going to be Loki or Thor. He thought so he was going to be Thor. Yeah, he went out working <laughs> out. He's like, well, I guess I'm probably going to be Thor. So he went out and worked out and gotten <laughs> to impeccable. Sh- like the guy's already in great shape. But he went out and got into ridiculous shape. And they're like, oh, you're going to be Loki. And he's like, oh, <laughs> well, disappointed. Um, because then he was worried this is just going to be one movie or maybe two movies. That's going to be it. And Look I'm going to be now. done. He's come so far. Jeez. Like, he puts so much effort into every single one of his roles, though. And you can really see it. And whenever he talks about acting, it's just it's really amazing. If you ever get to see him on stage, I got to see him in Betrayal. It's it's a spiritual experience. He's such a good actor. I just like so. people who enjoy what they do. Yeah. I'm crossing my fingers that there's no dirt on him. I mean, not, not no dirt, but... That I he really, has, I that really he has hope not there nothing. isn't. <laughs> he seems like such a good person. <laughs> I felt like the storyline was kind of like a very, very well-written fanfic, though. Like, it, it felt to me like something that you could find on Wattpad by someone who was really talented. Well, would it be a fanfic a too, though? Hmm? What would it be a fanfic too? Oh, anything. I just, sorry. I just mean like written on Wattpad as opposed, like, cause it feels like, you know, all those, Oh, I married Harry Styles. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> I was kidnapped by one direction fix. Maybe this know. was somebody's fan fiction about marrying Tom Hiddleston. It certainly could have been. I mean, that's how, isn't that how Fifty Shades of Grey got made? Because it was a Twilight fanfic? Anyways. <laughs> oh, God. <That's> worse. <laughs> All right. Here's a question I had for this. And this is, this is just a question I had for myself or about, the, about movies in general. Um, can ghosts actually understand a language other than the one that was their native tongue? That's a great question. Because there's that point where Edith starts talking to Enola. Now, Enola, it appears, only spoke Italian, maybe spoke a little bit of English. But Edith starts talking to the Italian ghost to get some, I guess, some get some clarity about what's going on in the house. And I just looked at him like, I, I, I've never questioned this before, but would the ghost even be able to talk to you hmm. in that language or understand what the hell you're saying? That's really interesting. Well, according to Salen in Host, ghosts, the the language barrier doesn't exist in the spirit world. <laughs> that so. was what I was thinking of. <laughs> I feel the like, host, like my... the host rules dictate everything. Okay. Okay. It's canon now. <laughs> they take place in the same universe. <laughs> 
I just I'm impressed you came up with an answer that makes perfect sense to me. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, because that that house then would house anyone who was who died or was killed there. So uh, you wouldn't be able to have anybody travel or do anything cool. But I, I was Maybe saying, her, well, that's true. She could have. I like the stories where the ghosts travel from place to place. Yeah. <laughs> You should watch, um, did you watch Julie and the Phantoms? I have not. Great show. You should watch that one. The ghosts get to travel in it. It's really fun. Hmm. Highly recommend. It's on Netflix. Sweet. All right. This, this is a real question I, for the two of you, though. How painful was the, the manuscript burning scene? Oh, my God. You thought you were a writer? Killed me. <laughs> <laughs> that was so mean. Of course it's mean. Yeah, but it was just so unnecessary. It was like she's already signing the stuff. Just, I don't know. Um, I can't identify with only having one copy, so it did nothing for me. <laughs> this was uh, James. It wasn't like they had copy copy printers back then or anything. I, I didn't say they didn't. I'm saying for me personally, I can't identify with that. I, I don't understand. So well, you can burn my manuscript there. all day and I'll just stare at you. <laughs> but you wouldn't take that as a personal slight, like somebody was doing that just to, even if you had more than one copy, you wouldn't take that as, well, that was an asshole thing to do. What I mean, they one, you ins- one, you insult me, and then two, you burn it. All right, I'm going to tell you guys all the story. And all you have to do is not tell my ex-wife that I told you this story. <laughs> okay. Everyone listening, don't go find my ex-wife, okay? All right, here we go. When I got divorced... She deleted 42 of my short stories, and they were the only copy I had. (laughs) Oh, my God. That is evil. So so now I always have too many copies of things. And I lived in a world where we had computers and could have backed it up. But, but, you know, it was 2005, and I didn't think in those terms. And uh, what kind of person does that? Nobody does that. No one is that level of monster. There, I said it. But um, wow. so, but so did we, you take that as a personal attack? I took everything with her as a personal attack. When did this become <laughs> a therapy session? Now, my point is, there's, there's parts that are good to it, too. Like, you know, those stories probably weren't great. So I've rewritten some. I've, you know, not published a few that definitely shouldn't have been published. So that's good. And uh, yeah, and it still sucks. It's something that I think about, you know what 16 years later yeah and and yeah i could cry right now it would be terrible you know but no um yeah like i've had it happen and it's fucking horrible and i don't know but then you add in you thought you were a writer right like like it's not even just her writing yeah it's not even just i'm taking this from you it's also just so you know, you shouldn't fucking try this again. You know what I mean? Like, not not that they expect her to live, but still, like, <laughs> yeah. And it was like know. you. She's telling you this this such a sad story that mm-hmm. you you want to empathize with her a little bit because you're like, oh well, you did have a really horrible life, so you think that she'd be like, oh, we're gonna kill you, but you know, we don't want to be awful about it. But no, she right. was just <laughs> she was just the worst. But again, I kind of love that because we never see that with female characters. So let's let's talk about how they're killing her because okay. they draw it out. It's poison. It's taking time. It's getting you, know, you sick and it's doing all these they, terrible things to you. Why, and I don't understand the point. That? I don't know. I'm like, why don't you just fucking kill her? Like, look at this place. You could like suffocate her and then throw her out in the snow and be like, I don't know. She went for a walk. They could you literally know? just like push her into one of those clay vats or something right she could fall off a balcony you know lots of things could happen oh wait i mean they had to (laughs) 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 no but when that happens i'm like why didn't you start with that (laughs) also could they not have just forged her signature on those papers right i don't think a notary was really going to check especially back in those days (laughs) well not only that you look at it this way if she is dead right then Thomas would uh, the get the prop- money anyway. Yeah, the, they were legally married. So the yep. property would transfer. I mean, I don't know what, what all the rules would be with, with her being, or with them being in England as opposed to the United States and transferring the property, but 
I'm pretty sure it would it would work in a similar way. If if he was the husband, she died. And maybe that's maybe that's the whole thing of poisoning her. You draw it out to where it's like, oh, she's got really sick. As opposed to, yeah, you know, she where it looks suspicious, where she happens to fall over the uh, over the railing or, you know, she was out in the snow and got hypothermia and died. Maybe they just wanted to make her really weak so that even if she did find out what they were doing, they could still threaten her with death to sign the papers. But I mean, if she was being poisoned, she probably would have assumed she would die anyways. So, like, I don't know. It's very unless strange. it was unless she had built up a tolerance to it. That's true. <laughs> and then she could switch the teacups. But, uh. And they're like, they're like, is she superhuman? What's wrong with her? <laughs> that would be a really yeah. funny twist. I just feel like there's so many better ways they could have killed her and not dragged this out. But this you know, then we wouldn't have a movie. Though. So. Yeah, absolutely. but again, yeah. James, you're, you're talking about gothic horror, though. You're going to have that slow death in a lot of cases where it is going to be painful. It's going to be torturous. It's going to be it's going to be drawn out. Abuse is slowly killing. Yeah, too. it's a metaphor. <laughs> so is the dog's survival. Did they mention metaphors anywhere? <laughs> oh, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> You know, you could even just I I would really like a scene where like she's like, why didn't you just kill me? And Lucille's like, because I enjoy watching this. Yeah. You know, what would have been happening was she would have said, I'm not trying to kill you. I just want to hurt you real bad. Really, really bad. (laughs) Good God. Lucille's in her Joker era. It's fine. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I guess that brings us to the end of it then. As far as this this battle that takes place where. Again, since we're talking about roles being reversed, roles being switched, right? Thomas doesn't save her because Lucille kills him. Uh, Dr. Alan McMichael can't save Edith either because he's been injured by, well, by both the brother and the sister. So now it's just the two women, Edith and Lucille, fighting it out. And Lucille has this great line. You either you killed me, and I'm going to butcher it. But basically, you you have to kill me, or I'm going to kill you, and I'm not yeah. going to stop until I kill you. And it just lets you know that, despite however, whatever weakened state that that Edith is in, or the way that people had abused her or used her in the past, there is no one she can depend on except for herself at this moment. Totally, and. When when she has that that statement of like no one's gonna help you out, you know that's when like the the movie comes full circle, where you've had this argument in these films, or at least had this brought up in so many films about where there's gonna be a guy that's gonna save this woman. There's always gonna be somebody who's gonna save her, and Lucille throws it out there and says, "There's nobody, no one's going to help you," and you know not that Thomas helps, but Thomas appears behind her and he's just there Mm -hmm. he doesn't help he just happens to be there and 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 edith takes the opportunity to to kill lucille and hits her one time and then she says that i'm not going to stop until i kill you i mean she she's basically a terminator ninja at this point (laughs) and edith ends up killing her which again i heard you the first time yeah (laughs) which was a great line yeah, it's a great line when she said it. Um, and again, this this is one of those things. If it had been in the movie theater, I could imagine the entire audience like laughing or clapping at that line. Totally. And I wish I could have been there. I wish I could have been there when it happened. And I know what theater I would have wanted to be in. <laughs> you could have, but you didn't want to see it. You've brought this pain on yourself. <laughs> yeah, Don. I wasn't old enough to see it when it came out in theaters. <laughs> I think there's only like two theaters when it came out in the Phoenix area. All right. So I guess that brings us to the end. So we will move into if people liked this film, what else should they watch? So, Corey, we will start with you. All right. I have a bunch. So I said Woman in Black. Yes. Um, okay. Hell yeah. Very, very similar. I felt uh, Sleepy Hollow. They're not exactly the same thing, but I feel like they give off a similar vibe. Um, Alfred Hitchcock's Rebecca. Sunset nice. Boulevard, specifically the musical, as well as Phantom of the Opera and Evita the musical. Because 
basically anything Andrew Lloyd Webber besides cats is just seems kind of gothic. I don't know. <laughs> Very fun times. If you're going to do a Vita and Sunset Boulevard, listen to the um, Patty Lapone versions because she's the queen. Cool. <laughs> All right. I will go with Shape of Water <laughs> because I said I would and because I keep bringing it up. Um, and then, you know, I've tried to do my uh, what would go well as a double feature with this. And I'm going to go ready or not. I know that's a Ooh, little weird, totally. but I think that they would be really cool together. For sure. Anyway, that's a Don, really you're good up. one. All right. Get ready. <laughs> I'm going to start it off with Titanic. Oh, interesting. Not going to give any reasons why. Just I, <laughs> I, I, I had the same feeling I had when I watched Titanic when I watched this movie. Uh, Pan's Labyrinth mentioned a couple of times. Gangs mm-hmm. of New York. The Others with Nicole Kidman. Yes. Uh, to give you a little bit more Benicio Del Toro, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Yeah. All right. I'm going to say The Turning. It wasn't a great movie, but it fits along the same lines as this film, like the same types of feeling uh, with with the supernatural and things like that. Hereditary, we, we mentioned earlier. I would definitely include that. I'm going to steal one that James didn't even think about, which is The Boy. Oh, I thought about it. I was, I was, <laughs> I'm sorry. You didn't say it. <laughs> no, because that started this double feature nonsense. Anyway, continue. The Grudge, <laughs> uh, Orphanado, 1408, which we have an episode on Orphanado, uh, Poltergeist, and I'm just going to say uh, Poltergeist, the original, not the remake. Um, and then anything from the Conjuring universe. Oh, definitely. And that's cool. all I got. Excellent. Well, then, I guess that brings us to a close. So, Corey, we'll kick it back to you. Where can people find you online, follow all your stuff, and uh, and um, just follow you on social media to be <laughs> entertained by your Twitter? Oh, God. You can find me on Twitter um, at, at Gory Corey Horror. You can find me on Instagram at underscore Gory Corey underscore. You can find me on my blog, gorycory.com or gorycory.net. And you can find my podcast on the Anatomy of a Scream Network. It's called The Scream Teens. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Very cool. Well, thank you for joining us once again. Thank and you so much. As for always, me. the door is always open. So let us know. Of course it is. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> awesome. All right. So until next week, I am, as always, James Sabata. And I'm Don Guillory. Googling pictures of a shirtless Tom Hiddleston. And we will see you next time here at the Necronama.com. They did the impossible. They managed to make Tom Holland look way older in this movie.